Okay, I'd like to introduce Bob Haswinkel. Bob was born in Indianapolis in 1925, and he was in the United States Army, the 77th Division, and fought in the battles of Leyte and Okinawa. He was 19 when he went into the Army, and the year was 1944. Bob, can you tell us something about how your mother felt when you went into the service and what the general attitude was of people in, in that time? Of course, this was relatively late in the war. The war started in 41, of course. And everyone was more or less conditioned to things that happening. Of course, we had gas rationing, food rationing, all those things. Uh, people working 10-hour days in defense plants, all those things. So if you were a healthy male, you know where you're going. And uh, so as soon as you graduate from high school, you know, you're going to be drafted. And I had a situation where I was actually turned 18 at the end of the year. My birthday is the 31st and 43. And uh, so they didn't want you not to finish high school. So they let me finish high school. I graduated in June of 44. And then, of course, I was eligible for induction. And the rule then was to, if you went into immediate induction, you could choose your branch of service. And I wanted to go in the Navy. So I opted for that. So as soon as I graduated, I went down to the draft board and said, let's go. And so you go through your physicals and all that. And then finally, when you're inducted, you go to an assignment board, which is made up of civilians. And I had a great big blue N marked in my papers. And uh, so you go in front of this board, and they look at the papers. And first thing, this fellow takes a great big red crayon and puts a great big A on it over the N. <laughs> He says, son, you're in the Army. <laughs> and uh, that was a big disappointment. So I went to the induction center uh, Fort Harrison in Indianapolis, and uh, then on a train, troop train, down to Camp Bannon, Texas. And, uh, and I'd taken some tests to indicate your aptitudes and things like that. And I'd taken a test that indicated I was good at remembering code, you know, the difference between dot and dashes and all that. So they scheduled me for a radio school, and the deal was you take 10 weeks of radio school and then seven weeks of infantry training, and you go on from there. Well, another thing happened. They decided they had enough radio people and they needed more riflemen, so I missed out on radio school. I ended up with 17 weeks of basic training at Camp Hanum, Texas. And after that, um, they give what you call a delay en route. In other words, you're on your way over, but you get a delay to go home. And so you had a 10 day delay en route. So from there I, I went back to Indianapolis and visited my, my family. I had a younger brother, my mother. My mother's a widow. My father died when I was 10. And my girlfriend. <laughs> and, uh, and then I uh, took a train uh, to uh, San Francisco and to Fort Oregon, California. More processing, shots, things of that nature. Then another troop train uh, up to Seattle, at Fort Lawton, Washington. And uh, from there, uh, we boarded a, uh, a troop ship uh, going to Hawaii. And uh, I remember it was very, very rough. There was a storm in Puget Sound, and uh, everyone was seasick. And well, next to combat, that was about as bad as you were going to get. Can you tell us a little about, about, about those two friends you had? from Indianapolis when you were in uh, training? Well, when we were inducted, there was um, two fellows uh, from Indianapolis, uh, a Jewish boy named Gerhard Samuel and another boy named uh, Jim Davis, and they attended other high schools in Indianapolis, but we got to know each other when we were inducted, and we ended up in the same company in, in basic training, and they all ended up in the 77th Division. And uh, the Jewish boy, interesting story, uh, his family got out just the head of the Gestapo, in Germany, and uh, he went in the army, and his brother went in the navy. And during, you know, I didn't even know what anti-Semitism was in those days. <laughs> but anyway, I, I could get be friends with him, and uh, then you know he was very bright, very bright, and he could take the rifle apart faster than anybody and put it back together blindfolded. And and you know, the people, you know, they called him a kike and do all sorts of things. And and I got to understand things like that. And Jim Davis was sort of an all-American boy. He was uh, big in athletics and things like that. But uh, both of them didn't make it off Okinawa. Okay. 
let's go back to Seattle and you're on this troop ship to in the rough seas to Hawaii and it's pretty grim. Take it from there. Well, I, I don't want to go into detail there and <laughs> make everyone sick. <laughs> but um, it was a rough voyage until we got about a day out of Hawaii and then we get in Hawaii and then you go to what they call replacement depot and you're just a casual outfit, you have no assignments, more orientation, uh, more shots, and uh, and then from there, a uh, few weeks, I pulled a little guard duty, chased prisoners in Schofield Barracks. Um, from there, another troop ship. And um, I, like I say, I think I had more days on at sea than half the Navy. <laughs> but anyway, the, the ship was heading for Leyte, and when we got to Leyte, the Initial invasion was already taking place, and the 7th, 7th Division was involved in that, and I was a replacement to that division. And uh, the main battle was still on, uh, over with, but there was still a lot of things going on. We were going up patrols up in the hills and finding chaps and things like that. And it was my first exposure to, you know, battle in the sense that I saw my first American dead, I saw my first Japanese dead, and. Um, the realization maybe this wasn't going to be as much fun as I thought. <laughs> yeah. And uh, from there, uh, of course, th this was built really a pr uh, preparation for the invasion of Okinawa. And so after a few weeks there at Lakey, another troop ship heading for Okinawa. And uh, it was a big convoy with lots of ships, every kind of ship you can think of, LSTs, destroyers, freighters, troop ships, and things like that. As we approached Okinawa, then the combat situation became more intensive in terms of expecting attacks from kamikazes and things like that. And as we got close to Okinawa, uh, you know, there was almost a battle stations all the time, and the troops had to stay below. It was hot, and it wasn't very nice. But as we approached towards Okinawa, then um, approaching Easter Sunday, which was April 1st, and that was the invasion of Okinawa, and my company was not involved in the first part of that invasion. In fact, I was a piece of cake. They just landed and went across the island with no casualties and no nothing. And we were anchored off of Okinawa and uh, just waiting. And um, then we were, uh, they had these two man Japanese submarines that were out there and they were worried about that. So we were on alert all the time for those. Those were kamikaze submarines? Yes. And uh, we never did have an incident, but we were on the defense all the time. And um, we could see, you know, the shoreline of Okinawa. And uh, the Navy fellow at the gun uh, placement, he had a big, powerful pair of binoculars. And he told me, come up here a minute and he showed me. He look at there and we saw this cliff and there was women throwing their kids off the cliff and then jumping off after them because they'd been told that we were going to be very cruel rape the women and do all sorts of horrible things. So they say, well, we'll just get it over with. So then um, we made a fake landing at the end of Okinawa to try to draw troops away from uh, the main defense line. And uh, then we got on back on the boat again. And then later on, I did go on the mainland of Okinawa. And we replaced a company uh, in the 98th Division who was right in the middle of the combat. Was your ship attacked by a kamikaze? Yes. You want to tell us about that? Um, no danger to me, really, at this point. But uh, we were in this convoy, and uh, it was sort of a relaxed day. It was pretty afternoon. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I looked over to one side, and I saw this, what we call, Betty Bomber. We identified Japanese uh, planes by uh, women's names, and it was a Betty Bomber, like a B-25. And it, it uh, crashed right into a, a ship next to us. And there were seven of them up there. And uh, so there was no time to general quarters. We want the troops down below when there's combat conditions. We couldn't get below. So I just found a spot that I could, while I was safe. And um, there was one of these bombers heading just above the water. He'd already dropped his bombs. And his idea was to hit the, the rear of the ship and disable the steering. And there was a five-inch gun on the back of the ship, and there was a Navy crew back there. And as it approached, they fired the gun. It hit the port engine of the plane, elevated it enough 
that didn't hit the ship, but it came across and shirt off that gun and took the crew with it. But we never stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, out of the seven planes, three hit ships and uh, the other four were shot down. Okay. So now you go, after that you land on Okinawa. And you're on, on land, you're on terra firma. Right. Go ahead. Well, we replaced a company, uh, 98th Division, and I think 90, 96th Division. I don't get the numbers wrong. Anyway, uh, they were in a position, and we relieved them. And uh, you know, my first impression was, you know, they all looked different. They were just sort of wild-eyed. You know, you, you get a look, and uh, you realize that uh, you know there's going to be some big things going on. And we took over their foxholes, and within five minutes, a sniper fired and killed our first guy. And um, so we were under heavy artillery fire there, and there was these what we call spigot mortars, a big Japanese mortar that was about this big around. And when it exploded, it would almost make a hole big enough to put a truck in. And uh, they were firing those on us. And in terms of being scared, I think being under artillery fire is the worst thing. You know, you, you get in the hole and you just hope it doesn't hit you. <laughs> There's no defense otherwise. You can't dodge it. And um, that's when the so-called combat fatigue comes up. We had a supply sergeant who was in the hole with us, and finally he, he just couldn't take anymore. And he says, i got to get out of here. And I said, no, you, you can't do that. And uh, he said, i got to go. And I finally I took my steel helmet and hit him in the head. And he gets tension. And we, this other fellow and I held him down until the fire lifted. And, he lost it completely. We had to put a blanket over his head and lead him back to an aid station. But he just he had it. The constant bombardment, the noise, yeah. the fear. And going back a little bit, see this whole this division, a lot of them were caught in the original draft. So these are fellows 35 and 40 years old now. Had kids, family, and they'd been to Guam, the heavy part of it, the Leyte. And you know they <laughs> filled up with mm -hmm. what they could tolerate. Yeah. And uh, it was just he couldn't handle it anymore. And no one put him down or anything like that. It was just one of those things. So you're in a foxhole on Okinawa. Yeah. And there's no battle lines over there. Uh, that you do your fighting in the daytime, and at night you set up a perimeter, your own company, a circle of foxholes. Uh, basically three men in a hole. Uh, anything above ground at night gets shot. Um, and supposedly two would sleep, one fellow would be awake to stand on guard. And uh, we'd, we'd get infiltrated and the Japanese would come in and when they throw their grenades they had a plunger on them and they'd take them and hit their helmet and that would detonate, the, you know, there'd be a fused but you knew there was a grenade coming, so you hear that clank, and you knew a grenade was coming, so you kind of took cover. And uh, and then finally we moved off that position up to a big escarpment, a big ridge full of caves and so on. And uh, the Japanese had dug out all sorts of caves and defensive positions and things like that. And we were on the, the southern slope, and they were on the reverse slope, and that slope was terraced, and the, the Okinawans had had, you know, crops there, gardens and things. And um, in the middle of the night, we heard a lot of noise and things like that, and we knew there was some activity. And, and the Japanese liked the sake, and you know, you'd hear bottles breaking, and with all the caves, you couldn't tell where it was coming from. But anyway, we thought that something was going to happen, and pretty soon we could hear rocks rumbling and things like that. And in order to come up these t levels of terraces, it wasn't short enough to jump. They had to climb. So as they climbed, the blocks would fall down and everything. So we knew that they were coming. So we waited until we thought they were just on the level just below us. And then we had the grenades, and we just took grenades. And they're made to if you let the handle fly. It's five seconds till it goes off. We'd let it pop, one, two, three, and toss it over the ridge. And uh, then they were hiring Bangs High and all this stuff. And, 
And so that went on, well, probably not as long as I think, but uh, in the morning um, when we woke up, we finally quieted down. We looked down there, and there was probably over 100 Japanese bodies down there. That, uh, and we, uh, some of them were moving, and all I talked about, we just took the ARs and sprayed the thing and, because we couldn't deal with prisoners or anything like that. And so we took that ridge, and then um, there was a, a ridge called Ishimi. Some, thing, you know, some things are hard to talk about there. Anyway, uh, it was a, a key thing uh, for the defense of Shuri Castle, which was the main defense he line for the Japanese. And we'd try to take it in the land, uh, during the day and suffered ha heavy casualties, and they decided they really wanted it. So they decided on a night attack. When I told you we didn't fight at night, we dug, it, dug in. And uh, so there was a, a group from Company E, and then they took one platoon from Company C and took some extra people from it and made it about 50, 58 people, I think. And they said, if somebody's either going to go across there at night and get on that ridge. And the idea is that you know, the Japanese wouldn't know we were there. And uh, the whole thing, uh, we were supposed to get rations that night and do a car and stuff, but we didn't get them. They said they'll supply you in the morning. And uh, so they said, well, you tie a piece of white gauze in the back of your pack, and we go over single file, and you get as close to the guy in front of you so you can see that gauze, but don't get any closer to keep spread out. And they have what they call a box. You know, the artillery will set up a, a field of fire in front of you to keep people, uh, the Japanese from infiltrating. And then they will do it on an irregular basis, just fire artillery shells, hoping to catch them. Well, they lifted the box on the signal so we could go through that. So we went out single file. And uh, we were taught whenever a flare goes up, you, you just kind of freeze and melt to the ground because the flare swings and creates shadow. And, so there's a lot of flares, but uh, we were able to get across there. So and while we were going across, we could see a bunch of little knolls, but we didn't get any fire from them. So we got up on the side of this, uh, this ridge and uh, you know, tried to dig in. And there's a lot of coral in Okinawa. And at the top of the, the ridge, the, the rain washes the, coral, the dirt off and washes down the lower part. So we were trying to dig foxholes, and it was difficult. You couldn't get very deep, and I was up towards the top with the uh, communication sergeant at Tony Del Rosso, and uh, we tried to dig a hole and wasn't do any good, and then all of a sudden everything broke loose, and uh, we started getting knee mortar fire from the reverse slope, and then all these old knolls that we passed turned out that there was Japanese in those positions, so they were like firing into the side of the hill. This was in the morning? Yes. When the light, first light came? Yes. And uh, that's when we suffered you know, most of the casualties. I mean, we, you know, we just didn't have any cover. They were just really doing a lot of harm to us. And I uh, tried to dig a hole, and I wasn't deep enough, so there was pieces of coral rocks. And I, instead of trying, I laid down, and I put up a coral rock, you know, tried to build a wall around me. And, It'd be Japanese gunfire, <laughs> you know, knocking it down fast as I could uh, put it up. And there was a hole down further down, and I could see a steel helmet protruding from that hole. And I hollered down there, and I said, you know, is there any room for me down there? I didn't get any answer. I took a couple of rocks or two down and hit the helmet, and uh, there was no response. So I decided I had to get out of there, so I got up and jumped and ran down to this hole and jumped in, and there was a, a lieutenant there, uh, he was dead, and he was sitting up, and I had to sit on his lap because it was the only place to be. And then another fellow was in a similar situation to me, he was trying to build a wall, and it wasn't working, and he hollered down, any room for me, and I said, well, there's more room. And you have, and I told him, you know, we have a dead person down there, and he says, I'm coming. I said, come on. He got up and ran.
sorry. That's right. Some things are not good memories. Well, I'll try and finish it off. Yeah. Anyway, machine gun fire caught him, and he fell in the hole on top of me dead. And uh, I couldn't move him, anything like that, so it finally got dark, and that was the only time we were able to move around, and so we tried to start getting organized. And, uh, you know, we had the wounded, they were crying, you know, our medic got killed, uh, the radio was shot, uh, and so we tried to consolidate, you know, to get people together and treat the wounded where we could, and you know, it was bad, you know, people crying and calling for their mothers. But, uh, and it went all like that, and this was the, the first day, and, um, you know, we could see battalion headquarters back of the, the hill way behind us on a ridge, and they could see us. But they couldn't get to us, and we couldn't get to them because we were surrounded. And by that time, of course, the Russians couldn't get to us, and we ran out of water. So we didn't have any water, we didn't have any food. And then, periodically, the Japanese would fire these knee mortars, and the knee mortars are actually a grenade launcher. They call them knee mortar because they kneel down and put them alongside and drop it in. And it has a high trajectory. It goes over the hill, so it'll land over the reverse slope. And they don't, they don't have a high velocity. You can see them coming. They spin like a football pass. And you see these things coming, spinning, you know, and you can see them coming. And, you know, if you see one, well, that's going to go that way. And you see another one that's going to go over here. And I saw this one, and it looked like that, that had my name on it. And I, after that night, I, some people helped me get the bodies out of that hole, so I was in this hole alone. I built a little shelf to put my cartridge belt and some stuff like that, some grenades and things. And I saw this grenade, uh, this motor shell coming, and I, I knew I was going to get it. So I just grabbed my helmet, pulled down hard, ducked down, and the thing exploded, and I thought I was dead, and it turned out it hit that shelf. And the dirt and everything went everything, and I kind of brushed myself off and looked down on my pants leg and there was a little piece of shrapnel stuck in my shin. I pulled it out and it didn't even bleed. <laughs> and everyone thought I was dead because, you know, they saw the explosion and when I started making noise and they, they were surprised I was still there. And then after that, you know, we, we threw our grenades and the Japanese didn't know how bad a shape we were in and evidently they didn't have communication with the people out in the open firing on us. So they could have come over that hill and taken us any time. So they just kept periodically firing new motors. So it was just a matter of staying in that hole and waiting. And, uh, you know, the motors were still coming, but fortunately I didn't get any close hits after that. And then it was a matter, you know, you're hungry and you're thirsty. And go put out that and then, you know, what's going to happen? You know, we were kind of waiting. Someone's going to come and help us. And, you know, we're going to the second day, and then the third day. And then they said, well, someone, they think someone's going to try to come and relieve us. So finally, uh, we heard some noise down below. And going this whole thing, you know, that's when I decided that I wasn't going to get out of there. And not that I wasn't religious, but <laughs> I tell you, you know how religious are when you get scared. <laughs> And I wore out the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> and uh, anyway, finally, uh, that night we heard some noise down at the base of the hill, and all of a sudden someone, there was a, a password. They said, you have changed every day, but they said, there's an emergency password, and they gave it to us, and we knew it was friendly. So uh, there was this company that came over, and they took over our, uh, our foxholes, and then they'd run a white tape back from the hill back to the battalion headquarters, and we followed that tape back because it was night. And uh, of course, they had some uh, medics and things to start taking care of the wounded and things like that. And I think two days later, they finally took that hill. 
So it was back to the battalion, and again, you're never out of combat. The only way you get out of combat over there was, you know, either get killed or wounded. You know, there was no going back for pass or anything like that. You just, you just stayed there. So we were in a, another position, but we were still in box holes and things like that. And so we uh, got some replacements because we lost so many people. How many people came off that hill? Um, I think 58 of my company went up there. And 13 came back. Um, so we had, you know, young guys replacement like me, <laughs> and uh, so we uh, got organized, and so we started making another attack. And this was on the, the 21st of May, and I got a little scratch earlier. Someone they put a bandaid on me and everything like that. And I turned out they'd give me a Purple Heart for that, which really wasn't right. But uh, on the 21st, we were attacking uh, another place called. Uh, close to Chocolate Drop Hill, which was a hill shaped like a chocolate drop. And we were getting knee mortar fire. And all of a sudden, I, I felt something hit my arm, and something hit my left arm. And there was three of us there, a lieutenant, he got hit in the eye. Another fellow got hit in the right arm with the same, same shell. And uh, so the lieutenant, he couldn't see because of bleeding. And, so I got on his left side, because this arm was bad, and the other fellow got on his right side, his right arm was bad. And um, so we headed towards an aid station. Well, we ran into some people and said, where's an aid station? We said, we don't know where there's an aid station. So we kept walking, and we finally ran into some tanks who were on the reverse slope of the hill firing at Japanese, and they, they came and tried to help us, and they said, well, we'll radio back and see if we can get you some help. So they radioed back, and pretty soon a, a jeep came back with some medics, and uh, they put some emergency bandages on, and uh, gave us shots of morphine. And they took us to a field hospital, which is sort of like mesh, you know, it's all tents, and so on. And uh, there they uh, operated my arm, and it was a, a shrapnel wound, maybe about this long, five inches long, but. It torn up all the muscles there, and later on I was told I had a remarkable surgeon because he could have just patched it up, and, and probably I'd lost this part of the use of this arm, but he put silver wire on each side of the wound down through the muscles and looped them, and then on the other side of the wound did the same thing so the muscles wouldn't retract. And later on I was told that's the only reason I had the use of this arm, because later on I had the scar tissue removed and, and so on. So uh, again, we were in tents, and again, uh, they gave us weapons because the Japanese would come down from the hills and throw shashful charges in the tents and pull them up. Uh, there was guards everywhere, and uh, there were six of us in this tent. And there was an orderly there, and we were all ambulatory. And this arm wound was a million-dollar wound. It was bad enough to get me out of there, but you know, it wasn't life-threatening. But, you know, it was bad enough I wasn't going to go back and fight again very soon. So they took us to an evacuation hospital, of course, the Yontan Airfield. And that was a big operation, and that's where they, they prioritized you, you know, like they put the tag on you, green tag, red tags, how serious you were. And then they were flying planes from Guam, hospital planes, to evacuate the wounded. And because the Japanese were still attacking the airfields and things like that, and there wasn't that much fuel for planes, they had to have enough fuel to make the round trip. And if the weather or the battle activity was so great, they would come and circle so long, then they have to go back to Guam empty. And so if between weather and the Japanese, uh, we were in this evacuation hospital. I, I can't tell you how many days, but several days. And finally, um, the weather broke, and uh, they said, well, you guys get ready, you're going. And so they took us to the airfield and got on a C-54, which is, a, you know, a DC-4 for all practical purposes. And they're flown by uh, Air Transport Command. These are all civilian pilots who are too old for military, but they fly these planes. No arms, no, no guns, no nothing. Just. And so uh, we took off, and uh, I could see Okinawa disappearing in 
meet the clouds, and I says, I'm never going back there. And it took us about 11 hours to fly to Guam. Still have my rifle. Arrived there in the middle of the night and uh, took to this hospital and and uh, I think it was about two or three o'clock in the morning. And of course, it was still dirty. I hadn't had a bath, you know, I can't remember when. And uh, the nurse says, well, you're not going to get any beds here until you get cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> and we were all worn out, and there was a couple of us going to this particular ward, so she put a chair in the shower. We sat down, she turned the shower on, and, and so we sat there in the shower, just kind of half asleep. <laughs> and so they came around, and. Um, and we were in a big hospital ward, and they changed the bandages and checked everything, and, and they said, well, you know, you're going to have to have more surgery, so uh, we're going to apply you to Hawaii. So I was in Guam 10 days. Another C-54 flight, 24-hour elapsed time, uh, with, uh, stops at Kwajalein, Johnson Island, and then into Hawaii, and then into a hospital there. And by this time, it was uh, July, August, and uh, then the rumors of the Japanese thinking of surrendering were out there, and so there was a lot of excitement there. And so, uh, finally, I think August 14th was when VJ Day, but finally the Japanese did surrender. And the deal was when they first made their negotiations, they painted one of these Betty bombers white and to land on Aishima for the first negotiations, and you brought up earlier about Ernie Pyle. Yeah. Ernie Pyle was a, a war correspondent, he was very famous, and he was from Indiana. And uh, he, he went with the troops, you know, he exposed himself to combat all the time. And there's an island off of uh, Okinawa, Aishima. My I wasn't involved in it, but my division uh, invaded that island and took it. But while he was covering my outfit, he, uh, he was killed by a sniper. That, uh, and there's a memorial over there put up in his behalf on, by our division. So uh, in Hawaii, uh, when VJ came, of course, lots of jubilation and things like that, big parade and so on. And, uh, and then, again, they're trying to get people home. And the doctor said, you know, we can do your surgery here, but he says, you know, why don't we just send you home? By that time, I was ambulatory and I wasn't suffering. I just had a big scar here. I couldn't bend my wrist down. And uh, so I was in a, what they call a rehab hospital, because you need you know, either ready for combat or something other than that. So it was sort of a casual uh, situation. And, uh, and finally, uh, they put us on an old beat up uh, troop ship and sent us to uh, San Francisco. And uh, was there in the hospital for a few days, had fresh milk, real eggs, <laughs> all the goodies. And then they, what they would try to do is send you to a hospital close to your home. And the closest one to me was a hospital in Cambridge, Ohio. So from San Francisco, they uh, put us on a hospital uh, train, took us to Chicago, and then certain cars were going to go to certain hospitals, and they attached you to a regular train to land up in Cambridge, Ohio. And there they uh, performed additional surgery and uh, removed the scar tissue. And I didn't get to use my arm completely back. Uh, it doesn't hurt anymore, but it's not as strong. And, and I played the violin all through the high school, so <laughs> I had to give up the violin. <laughs> well, your mom was a piano teacher, right? Yeah, I'm, my mom, um, you know, I, like I said, my father died in 1936, and she raised my brother and I giving piano teachers, and my whole family is very musical, so I sang in the choirs and I played the violin all through high school, uh, grade school and high school, so it was kind of tough giving that up. But uh, we're kind of winding down this thing, that is, uh, that time there was a point system. You got so much credit for the uh, number of months in the service, how many battle stars you had, um, numbers months overseas, there's a point in time when you get so many points, then you were eligible for discharge. And uh, so as finally, you know, with then I got another Purple Heart course with this arm wound, so that counted something. So finally I had enough points to 
be discharged, and uh, there was a discharge center at Camp Atterbury, which is south of Indianapolis, and April 25th of 46, I was discharged. So wasn't in that long, but long enough. A lot happened. Could you just um, hit the highlights of your trip back to Okinawa? Yes, uh, I had to go to Japan and Taiwan on business, and I had a boss who was a Marine who uh, was aware of my activity in Okinawa. In fact, he's a historian like yourself. And uh, I said, well, if I get that close to Okinawa, I'd like to go back. And he said, well, he says, you go and don't worry. He says, uh, we'll pay for it. And uh, my wife, Jean, went with, us, with me. And after doing our business in, in Japan, we uh, flew to Okinawa. And uh, I made reservations at a hotel, and we got there, and they lost their reservation. Anyway, we got entrenched there, okay. And the next morning, I went to the, the desk, and they, someone spoke English. And I uh, asked them if they could find me a cab driver who spoke English. And he said, that might be tough. But she's let me make some phone calls, and pretty soon he called me and says, I think I have someone. So he arranged for this cab driver to pick us up, and I had this book called The Last Battle, Okinawa, and it had a bunch of military maps and things like that. And I showed the maps to him, and I said, I'd like to find this ridge. And so we floundered around, and finally uh, I spotted the thing. There was a, where the battalion headquarters was actually a, a hospital there now, a Supreme Hospital. And I looked across that open field, and I said, that's it. And there were sugar cane fields down below and everything like that, and I said, can you get down there? He said well, he would try. And so we wandered around some back roads and things and finally ended up down at the base of the ridge. And Okinawa was famous for its poisonous snakes. In fact, they gave us a little pamphlet telling us to watch out for them, coral snakes, you know, little tiny things, but very, very bad. And my wife doesn't like snakes, so she stayed in the car. But I decided you know, I'd walk up there and uh, walk over there. And of course, Everything came back, mm. and uh, anyway, uh, later on uh, we we're going to have lunch, and uh, I said, "Well, we'd like some Okinawan food," and so he said, "We'll go this way." So we went to this restaurant. There wasn't much to go to in any part of ambiance, but <laughs> we had some good food, and I noticed him being very nervous, and we asked him why, and he says, "Well, I don't like it here." So why is that? He says, well, I, I was in the Army here. So his side of the story was that he got wounded in that very area and played dead while the Americans went around him. Fortunately, we didn't shoot him because we had mm -hmm. we because they played tricks with us. And uh, so he survived, and they carried him back on an old door as a stretcher, and he survived the war. And so uh, my wife took a picture of us standing in front of this ridge. Yeah, that's a great story. Have today. That's a great story. So when I finished up, I guess the, the thing that still a mystery of life while I'm here. I don't know why. I really don't know. Well, I want to thank you for giving this interview. I know it brings back a lot of bad memories and thoughts, but I think it's good for the people today to, to know what you guys went through.